You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 193, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Problems of Society, an Esoteric View, from Luciferic Past to Aramonic Future. Ten lectures held in Zurich, Bern, Heidenheim, and Berlin between the 4th of February and the 4th of November, 1919. Translated by Matthew Barton. Lecture 1, given in Zurich on the 4th of February, 1919. Since I am giving public lectures here on the social question, it may be a good idea for us in these branch evenings to consider more inward aspects of the riddle of society, which is of such importance and concern today. Whenever we meet another person, perceive him with our body-bound faculties of perception and feeling, we must, of course, acknowledge his intrinsic, deeper-lying inner nature. We can only perceive this more inward reality of a person when we realize that basically it is connected with everything that streams and weaves through the world as we experience it, informing our whole life. Our anthroposophic worldview is really very different from ordinary views of the world. If you take a look at my title, Occult Science, where I attempted to summarize this anthroposophic view of the world, you will find that not only is our nature connected with evolution on earth, but this earth itself has emerged from former planetary embodiments, from moon evolution which in turn proceeded from Sun evolution, and this again from Saturn evolution. But if we study these larger contexts and trace these great spans of evolution right up to our current developmental stage, we also find that the human being is intrinsic to them, is everywhere present. We regard the whole cosmos with all its forces and with everything that occurs in it as intrinsically related to the human being. The human being, in this view, stands at the center of the cosmos. In one of my mystery plays, in a conversation between Capacius and the Initiate, I gave special emphasis to this foundation of our whole anthroposophic worldview and its relation to human sensibility. The impression it inevitably makes on us when we see that all generations of the gods, all forces in the cosmos, have ultimately been invoked to create us, to place us at the center of creation. At the same time, I have stressed the great need for humility, specifically in relation to this absolutely true idea. We have to keep reminding ourselves that if we were actually able to manifest our whole being, living in and around us as we lead our lives on earth, if we were able to experience and realize this being, we would embody a microcosm of the whole of the rest of the world. But how much of it can we experience How much can we manifest of what we are as human beings in the loftiest sense? When we realize what we human beings actually are, we can find ourselves fluctuating between feelings of humility and arrogance. Certainly, we should not puff ourselves up in pride, but nor should we let ourselves dwindle into abject insignificance. We would do so if we did not set our sights as high as possible, our human task, remembering our true nature as an all-encompassing worldview discloses it. 
Basically, we can never have lofty enough ambitions about what we should be. We can never sufficiently prize the deeper cosmic feeling of human responsibility that comes over us when we consider that the whole universe is centered upon our human nature. But rather than remaining a more theoretical idea in an anthroposophically oriented science of the spirit, this should become a feeling, a sense of holy awe toward what we should be as human beings and yet can scarcely ever be. And when we meet another person, we should often have a sense that they bring something to expression in this present incarnation. There they stand, and passing from one incarnation to another, a quality of the infinite informs the succession of their lives. There are other ways, too, in which we can broaden and deepen such feelings. Founded on a science of the spirit, this feeling gives rise to a proper sense of the value of humankind, a sense of the dignity of the human being. This feeling can fill our whole soul, expanding fully within us, and this alone will imbue us with the right mood in our individual dealings with other people. The mood I have here described is one we can regard as a first essential achievement of a modern, anthroposophically oriented spiritual science. A proper estimation of humanity in the world, that is the first thing. A second thing will emerge from a preoccupation with anthroposophic spiritual science, insofar as this develops real qualities of soul rather than remaining abstract and intellectual. And it is this. As we encompass all phenomena in the world, the elements of earth, water, and air, everything shining down to us from the stars, the breezes that blow, everything conveyed to us by the different realms of nature, an anthroposophic outlook shows these to be related to us in some way. And everything becomes valuable to us, precious, as we relate it to ourselves in a certain way. A feeling relationship forms as we develop a supersensible perception of all things. The poet Christian Morgenstern has expressed this feeling in some beautiful verses, as I have often mentioned when discussing a particular section of the Gospel of St. John. A feeling that comes over us when we allow the ascending realms of nature to work upon our sensibility. We see that the plant must inevitably feel itself to be higher in the hierarchy of life than merely lifeless minerals that give it the soil in which it roots. But it will say this, quote, Though I am a higher entity than you, I grow forth from you and owe you my existence. In gratitude I bow before what is lower than I am. Close quote. The same quality again is one we must feel to exist in the relationship between animal and plant and likewise in the human kingdom. The human being having ascended to a higher level in the sequence of his evolution. With reverence and respect he must look back to what in some senses is lower than he is doing so not in a merely abstract conceptual way, but really embodying and experiencing in his soul as a cosmic feeling all that pulses, lives, and creates in all things. This is where the real essence of anthroposophic spiritual science leads us. It gives us the capacity to form a living human relationship with all other things. And then there is a third thing. What spiritual science tells us of the spirit is not vague, pantheistic talk of spirit, and yet more spirit underlying all things. No, this spiritual science does not merely speak of the real spirit, but seeks to speak out of reality from the spirit itself. Someone who lives in spiritual science 
knows that as thoughts of the Spirit form in him, it is the Spirit itself that lives actively in these thoughts. Someone touched, if you like, by the breath of spiritual science does not wish to express mere thoughts about the Spirit, but to let the Spirit utter itself through his thoughts. The unmediated presence of the Spirit, the active power of the Spirit, are what spiritual science seeks. But now let us compare what is implanted in our inmost being of soul through a living involvement in spiritual science with what I spoke about yesterday, the social demands emerging over time and living in a particular way in, in quotes, proletarian consciousness as modern requirements in society. Consider what lives in this proletarian consciousness today and, in a sense, provides the basis of its perceptions, an ideology, a mere fabric of abstract ideas. Nowadays, in fact, it is thought that all soul spiritual experiences are, in essence, founded on merely commercial and economic factors, which alone are seen as real. The human being is considered to stand in a context of economic factors in which his struggle for survival unfolds. From these factors arises and emerges like smoke and mist all that he thinks and perceives, all that manifests in his art, all that he regards as ethics and morality, as law and justice and so on, all these things are seen as ideological shadows. Comparing this shadowy life of spirit as it is thought to be with a life of spirit that seeks to enter our souls from an anthroposophically oriented science of the spirit, we find that the latter, via the human soul, tries to place the spirit itself into the world of a living reality. The modern worldview rooted in middle-class perceptions and then disastrously adopted by the proletariat has banished the spirit, has no place for it. And so the spirit that should live in people as awareness of living creative reality now leads only a shadowy existence as mere ideology. How much of the deeper reality of human life whose whole context we see only by looking back before Earth evolution to Moon, Sun and Saturn stages, is contained in this narrow view of earthly life perceived only through the senses, through our ordinary bodily perceptions. The realities of human existence fade from this modern consciousness. Only anthroposophic spiritual science gives us a true sense and feeling of human dignity, enabling us to find a proper relationship with others whom we encounter, as one individual meeting another. Is it actually conceivable, in the present chaos of human society, that people can find a proper relationship with each other, one which in turn offers the only real foundation for solving the conundrums of society? Can a mutual recognition of one another's rights actually emerge unless founded on a cosmic sense of human dignity that springs only from sources of spiritual perception and spiritual feeling? In our relationship to the external world, we ought not to seek abstract thoughts as economics and sociology do, but develop direct personal connections with the diverse realities of the world. As far as outer circumstances are concerned, we have to establish a real relationship to this world. Through anthroposophic spiritual science, we have to develop the inner feeling and sensibility I referred to above toward all non-human creatures and entities, toward everything that stands both below and above us in the hierarchies of nature and the divine order. Now let us consider two things here. 
on the one hand the proletarian consciousness I spoke of, whose intellectual apprehensions are alienated to a very great degree from a sense of the living spirit at work in human beings, and instead turn all spiritual life into ideology. If you picture how the modern proletariat thinks and in particular feels about his fellow men, and how this outlook informs his views, you will realize how very far removed this is from an estimation of the human being that fully comprehends the spirit. Consider also how far removed, ultimately, is the purely economic value of things, which has become more or less the only thing of importance for people nowadays. From the values we learn to invest in non-human creatures and entities, through our deeper relationship to them, as I express this in terms of anthroposophically oriented spiritual science. Here we have two different things. On the one hand, the condition which the unspiritual nature of recent centuries has bred in humanity, affecting human souls to a very marked degree, and on the other, the hopes that can awaken at the prospect that a true science of the Spirit can today enter humanity. If we put these two things side by side, it becomes apparent, surely, that in a human soul really imbued with what spiritual science can give it, the right light will be shed on the riddle of society. If you bring the right sensibility to bear on these two perspectives, one hopeless, the other hopeful, then your work on behalf of anthroposophically oriented spiritual science will become what it needs to be for humanity today, an existential necessity which should pervade all other work and creativity. No doubt you will say that nothing appears more comprehensible in the whole context of humanity's recent development than the emergence of the social problems that beset us, and that at the same time there is nothing more comprehensible than people's sense of helplessness before these problems. You see, at the very time that these social ills are knocking so audibly at the doorway of our understanding, of our views of the world, humanity is also passing through one of its severest trials. The need to turn toward the Spirit through each person's inmost strength. Nowadays no revelations will be vouchsafed to us if we do not ourselves seek them in freedom. For since the middle of the fifteenth century we have been living in the era of the consciousness soul in which everything must be drawn into the light of awareness. There is no point lamenting the, quote, terrible catastrophe, close quote, that has broken over humanity, or asking why the gods have allowed this to happen. There is no point in asking why the gods do not lead us safely out of this situation in which humanity finds itself so pitifully ensnared. Instead, we must remember that we live in an age when inner human freedom must unfold and manifest, in an age when the gods may not reveal their most intrinsic intentions to us except in so far as we approach them by our own free resolve, willingly accepting them into our inmost soul. We stand at a turning point today in relation to the most vital aspects of human evolution, in relation also to Christianity. There are individuals working in the social field today who gladly accept Christianity, yet draw from it only as much as they can relate to their own social ideals. But this is not the way to integrate this impulse of core importance, this impulse which gives all earthly reality its true meaning and purpose. We have to realize that Christianity has so far only just begun to be embodied and expressed in humanity. Little more of Christianity has so far come to expression than human feelings in respect of the mystery of Golgotha 
apprehensions that Christ once lived on earth in the human being Jesus and passed through the mystery of Golgotha. In a sense, these first two thousand years of Christianity on the earth have achieved little more, since human understanding has not yet ripened sufficiently then to make it apparent for human awareness that Christ connected himself with the earth, that he descended to the earth. Only now, in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, that of consciousness-soul development, will humanity become mature enough not only to understand that Christ passed through the mystery of Golgotha, but also what actually lives in this mystery. Humanity will only come to understand the content of this mystery of Golgotha through the spiritual foundations that can develop during this fifth post-Atlantean era. Here in these branch meetings, I have frequently said how trivial it is for people to say that we, quote, live in a time of transition, close quote. All times are transitional. We need to identify what each particular transition consists of. What is changing or transforming? I have characterized the major changes now occurring in human consciousness and human soul development from many different perspectives. Today again, from one specific angle, I would like to describe changes occurring in human evolution on earth in our particular time. As I said a few moments ago, we try not only to formulate thoughts about the spirit in our anthroposophic spiritual science, but seek, rather, for the reality of the spirit. Seek thoughts in which the spirit itself lives and in which the spirit manifests. We can put it like this, too. Christ Jesus spoke these words, quote, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, close quote. While the Gospels are not the sole exhaustive source of Christianity's content, we can acknowledge the truths of anthroposophic spiritual science by realizing that Christ really is here and will remain with us always to the end of earthly times, not just as a finite power we are obliged to believe in, but as a living power that continually reveals more of itself And what is this power revealing in our times? It reveals the content of modern anthroposophically oriented spiritual science, which seeks not only to speak of Christ, but to express what Christ is at present trying to tell us through human thoughts. In ancient times, when humankind still lived a more instinctual existence, and the human soul possessed something of an atavistic clairvoyance, this soul gave expression to spirit. Spirit lived in human thoughts and in the human will. The gods then lived in human beings. Today they do so still, albeit in a rather different way from ancient times, when the gods were pursuing a particular divine task in the form of earthly evolution. They attained this goal by inspiring human beings with their powers, endowing the human soul with imaginations. However strange it may sound to you, the divine worlds achieved and fulfilled their most intrinsic aims for earthly evolution, doing so basically by the end of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. For this reason, the spiritual beings of the higher hierarchies, whom we call the gods, now have a different relationship to the human soul than they did formerly. In ancient times, the gods sought out human beings to realize their goals on earth with their aid. Today, by contrast, we must seek the gods, must raise ourselves to them out of our inmost impulse. Today we must seek to realize our aims, our conscious aims, with the help of divine powers. This is the fitting stance for people from the age of the consciousness soul onward. In former times, human aims were unconscious, instinctive, 
because divine aims lived within them. Human aims must now become ever more conscious, thus possessing powers that raise these aims to the gods and enable us to seek fulfillment of human aims with the aid of divine powers. Think these words through carefully. They are of great importance. These words express a need for us to embark upon an original, elementary striving out of ourselves, which we can seek in diverse realms of the soul, above all at a deeper social level. Here we must consider interpersonal relations from a more spiritual scientific perspective. In ancient times, human beings rightly stood in far closer relation to each other by virtue of the fact that gods were realizing their aims in human evolution. Today people are, in a sense, driven asunder and have to seek and reconnect with each other in a quite different way. People still need to learn how to do this. Even superficial observation can show this to be the case everywhere. Nowadays people know little about each other. In its cosmic apprehension of human dignity and human nature, spiritual science is as yet only in its infancy. People do not generally penetrate to the depths of each other's soul but this is what must be found in a deeper social organism. New insight into human nature must enter human evolution. But since the prevailing outlook today, devoid of spirit as it is, sees the human being only in terms of flesh and blood, we need to start perceiving the activity of gods in other human beings if we are to forge a really spirit-filled social organism. And this will only happen if we ourselves do something about it. One thing we can do here is to seek a certain deepening of our own life of soul. There are many ways to do this. I will only outline one meditative path here. We can look back on our life for all sorts of reasons, asking ourselves how we have developed as an individual from childhood onward, But rather than focusing primarily on our own experiences, joys and sorrows, we can consider the people who affected us in some way as parents, siblings, friends, teachers, and so on. Instead of placing ourselves at the center of our thoughts, we can place there those who intervened in our life in some way. Then we will find, for a while at least, that our self has developed far less, really, from what we ourselves possessed, and much more from what flowed into us from others. If we honestly and vividly picture this in a review of our life, our relationship to the world will actually become quite different. This review will leave us with feelings that act as germinal seeds in us, seeds of real insight into human nature. Someone who repeatedly examines himself and his life with a view to perceiving the part played in it by others, who may have died long ago or are now no longer close to him, will approach other people and form individual relationships with them in a way that allows an imagination to rise up in him of the true being of this other person. This is necessary now and in the future, as an inner social requirement for human development. In this way, anthroposophic spiritual science must become eminently practical in a way that engenders life and makes it fruitful. I would like to offer one further perspective. In former times, all self-knowledge, all self-reflection and observation of one's own soul was relatively easier, a good deal easier than it now is. And this is because a profoundly inward social impulse is now emerging, not just in relation to people's awareness of relative poverty or wealth, which comes to expression in the following way, for instance. Nowadays we take little account of continuing maturation throughout a human life. Inwardly authentic people such as Goethe 
still felt this ever-developing maturity. Even in advanced old age, Goethe wished to go on learning, knowing that he was still not all that he could become. He looked back to his youth and young adulthood and saw that all that had occurred then was a preparation for what he could now experience in old age. People today scarcely think like this, especially when they consider people as social beings. Today everyone thinks he is ready to be a public servant at the age of twenty and make, in quotes, democratic decisions. There is little awareness that we develop as life progresses and we mature toward old age. People do not think of this. That is one thing we have to relearn, that the whole compass of life brings us something and not just the first two to three decades. And then there is something else we need to learn. Besides considering ourselves, we look around us at people of differing ages, above all the child who enters life at birth. In the same way, as human evolution on earth was once instinctive, a given, but is now no longer so, things that formerly arose by themselves and became manifest in the human soul are now only available through our extreme exertions and efforts to gain supersensible knowledge, or at least real knowledge of life. As for humankind in general, much that belongs intrinsically to the child's nature remains hidden from him. Yet it is not only what the child will come to perceive as he matures toward old age that initially remains hidden from him, but a great deal else that was revealed in the past to humanity in ancient instinctive times when people still possessed an atavistic clairvoyance. This too remains hidden from us if we reflect only upon ourselves. Between the cradle and the grave there is something that cannot reveal itself if we only seek knowledge within ourselves, and this is one of the peculiarities of the consciousness soul age. We can seek clarity of consciousness, but much in the field of vision that this clarity should illumine in fact remains concealed. This is a peculiarity of our times. In childhood we enter the world and there is something in us that is important for this world, for humanity's social relationships, for historical insights. But we fail to discern this if we seek no further than ourselves, whether as child, man, woman, or in advanced age. But it can be perceived in another way if our mature human soul as man, woman, or old person is more finely tuned through real spiritual sensibility and then considers the child, then it can become apparent that something is revealed in the child that the child himself cannot discern and will never be able to by his own devices however long he lives. But which can be discerned in another's soul when the latter, in old age, looks back to this child. Then there is something that can be revealed through the child, not in the child himself, and not in the man or woman into whom this child develops, but in another, who looks back lovingly from advanced age to the earliest life of this child. I indicate this especially because in such a characteristic of our times you can discern the social impulse in the broadest sense that flows through our age. Surely a profoundly social trait is implicit in this necessity for something fruitful to enter life solely by virtue of the fact that an old person learns from an infant to coexist for the highest good. Not just any person with any other but specifically an old person with an infant. This social coexistence is something that shows us the inmost spirit and meaning of our age. Anthroposophic spiritual science can disclose such things to people whose familiarity with other aspects of spiritual science has prepared them to study deeper aspects of the social problem. 
All of you face a social task of great dimensions. If you are to draw on the social sensibility we can kindle here to benefit modern humanity. You are especially fitted to do so through anthroposophically oriented spiritual science. In the context of current debate on issues of social coexistence and socialism, you can try to kindle a deeper social sense, a deeper understanding of human relations. If you succeed in doing this, you will be drawing on anthroposophy to fulfill a vital social task. Next week, we will speak further of these matters in the branch lecture between the two public lectures. The end of Lecture 1